I just want to preface uh, before the video starts that I do not agree with everything that this particular pastor uh, teaches, but I did review this video and the contents therein <clears throat> and checked it historically, and the best of my ability, I could not find one hole in his argument. So um, it's just historically accurate and historic facts. Um, I also want to preface this by saying that I am not a conspiracy theorist. I don't believe there's a Je Jesuit under every rock. Um, <clears throat> I don't think Masons are taking over the world. I don't believe none of that. I think the church will be victorious by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But my question to you is, are you willing to follow a Jesuit system? A uh, fourth part of our uh, studies in the subject of dispensationalism. And we want to look at uh, this evening uh, the origins of uh, dispensationalism. And because of that, it's rare uh, that I have to make this admission. Uh, most of our time will not be spent in the scriptures uh, this evening. So I want to admit that from the start. Um, we will be looking more at uh, history um, this evening. So. Uh, I do pray that that will not be um, a problem uh, and a, a lack of blessing for us tonight. We will look at some scripture and we pray that that would indeed be a blessing uh, to our souls. Uh, as in our previous studies, we will uh, consider the writings of Charles Ryrie in his book Dispensationalism. Uh, we won't be looking as much uh, to his uh, writings as normal, but we will be referring to some of what he says in the chapter which deals uh, with the origins of uh, dispensationalism. Uh, the origin of a doctrine is an extremely important part of our study of any doctrine. I remember many years ago the first systematic theology that I bought uh, was Lewis Berkhoff and then sometime afterwards I saw that he'd done a separate volume, The History of uh, Christian Doctrine, and I found that very beneficial. To see the historical setting of any doctrine, whether it be a true doctrine or a false doctrine, is always a very extremely important part of understanding uh, that doctrine. So, what was, or what, uh, historically speaking, what was the origin of dispensationalism. I've done quite a bit of research on this um, and I wanted to really get, um, it's so easy to, you know, in, in the modern age of Google and just sort of go on the internet and find whatever, uh, but I wanted to get, and I did uh, use the internet, but I wanted to get authoritative uh, statements. I didn't just want to get, you know, the, the first website that came along to find something uh, that would fit uh, to my need. So I spent uh, a good number of hours uh, researching this and I came across a, um, a historical paper given by a brethren historian by the name of F.R. Cohen uh, in a paper given in 1966. Uh, and he deals with the origin of dispensationalism uh, in that lecture that he gave at that time. The title of his paper was Prophetic Developments with Particular Reference to the Early Brethren Movement. In uh, that paper, in the context of the Reformation and its view of the papacy as Antichrist, he said this, Meanwhile, the papal counter-reformation was not sitting quietly beneath the slur of Antichrist. We know the reformers uh, refer to the Pope as the Antichrist. He goes on to say, uh, two Jesuits, Francesco Ribera and Louis de Alcazar, produced detailed studies of revelation in which very different interpretations were advanced. Ribera projected the whole book after the sixth seal into the future age of Antichrist. He goes on to say, so we must go back and trace this futurist interpretation which was in so many circles to supersede the old historicism. Ribera, it will be remembered, had put forward a futurist scheme some 250 years before in an attempt to absolve the papacy from the reproach of Antichrist. At the turn of the 18th and 19th centuries, a very different Catholic writer had adopted his views. And he refers here to a man by the name of Manuel Lacunza, 
who lived 1731 to 1801. He was a Jesuit of Chile and had been expelled with his order from that country and went first to Spain and then to Italy, where he became an anchorite. There he devoted himself entirely to the study of the scriptures and for 20 years was engaged in writing his book, The Coming of the Messiah in Glory and Majesty. Distressed by corruptions in the Roman church, his work may have followed Ribera's ideas. Now, at this point, uh, um, I'm quoting, but uh, to some degree, uh, I'm not sure I totally agree with his point here, but I'm just quoting here at the moment. His work may have followed Ribera's ideas, but it was far removed in purpose from Ribera's. In his dedication, he wrote, I desire and purpose to stir up and even to oblige the priests to shake off the dust from their Bibles, inviting them to a new study and examination, a new and more attentive consideration of that divine book. His scheme was largely futurist, and his Antichrist would arise in an apostate Roman church, the signs of which were already present. The title of the book describes its central theme, the glorious second advent. Lacunza had no illusions as to the reception of his book by the Roman hierarchy. He wrote under a pen name, Ben Ezra, and at first his book was circulated privately in manuscript form. Yet even in that form, it had wide influence. Eventually, well after his death, the book was printed secretly in Spain in 1812. The book caused something of a sensation and was translated into many languages. Two English translations appeared, one by uh, the celebrated Edward Irving, and thus the book enters uh, importantly into our story. As Andrew Miller, a 19th century exclusive brother, wrote, it pleased the Lord to revive in many minds during the first quarter of the present century a deep interest in the restoration of Israel to their own land and the consequent glory of Messiah's reign. Several books were published on this subject between the years 80 and 12 and 80 and 25, but the one which created the greatest interest is entitled The Coming of Messiah in Glory and Majesty by a South American Roman Catholic priest, Emmanuel Lacunza, who adopted the nom de plume of Ben Ezra, a converted Jew. It was translated into English and published in London in 1827 with a long preliminary discourse by the Reverend Edward Irving. He goes on to say this, um, Code says this, so it was that the famous Albury Conference held at Drummond's country seat in Albury near Guildford, were convened, assembling at least in the earlier years some of the flower of evangelical belief from all denominations. Among them was Edward Irving, brilliant Scottish preacher from London, whose eloquence was having a great impact on all circles, and who sponsored Lacunza's book while the conferences were being held. Now these... Albury, uh, Albany of wrote here, it's Albury. Albury conferences were held uh, each year uh, over a five year period from 1826 to 1830. They were foundational uh, regarding uh, these doctrines. In regard to these conferences, Code says, immediately after, and this is very important to get, immediately after these conferences, the teaching of the secret rapture of the church namely that the second advent will take place in two stages the first being a rapture of the church before the great tribulation from which she is thus delivered became prominent this teaching is a variation of futurism and was apparently unknown before this time again just to remind you this is a brethren a plymouth brethren historian that is saying uh, these things also, he goes on to say, uh, the exact origin of the teaching of the, se of the secret rapture is obscure, but in some recorded but unpublished reminiscences, B.W. Newton, the prophetic teacher who was so prominent in the early Brethren movement, suggests that Irving introduced it at one of the Albury conferences. 
Now, he goes on, and I'm skipping through, obviously, I'm not quoting everything he says here, just picking out the main points. He goes on then to talk about the, the connection with Pentecostalism. Uh, another interesting development which arose about this time and was fostered by the conferences, so the same conferences that the secret rapture doctrine came out of, um, he goes on to say, was an expectation in some quarters that at the time of the end, the Pentecostal gifts would be restored. Prominent in urging this was the Anglican James Haldane Stewart, who attended the Albury Conferences. In March 1830, there was therefore considerable excitement when news came of an outbreak of tongues in a village near Glasgow. And the fifth and final Albury Conference in July of that year uh, stressed the duty of praying for a personal possession of those gifts. From such details of these tongues as are available, it does not seem that they included coherent utterances. Uh, they were soon after followed by faith healings in the same group of persons. Now uh, we move from Albury. I keep writing Albany in my uh, notes, but it's Albury. Um, uh, from Albury to Powers Court in, in County Wicklow. Actually, I noticed uh, a couple of um, uh, people that I uh, listened to um, refer to Dublin constantly, but it's actually Wicklow. Um, and there's so the, the five conferences in Albury were from 1826 to 1830. Then the next year, the conferences moved uh, from there to Powers Court in County Wicklow. Meanwhile, the Albury studies had passed into saner channels. In October 1831, the year after the last conference in, in Albury, Lady Powers Court threw open her home in Ireland to a similar but larger gathering under the chairmanship of the rector of Powers Court, the Reverend Robert Daly, later Bishop of Cashel. In general, the conferences apparently eschewed the gifts as a painful subject, and the discussions appeared to have been more moderate than at Albury. Unfortunately, not a lot of information survives as to those conferences. He goes on a bit, I think I'll just uh, stop there. We've said enough to show this, or we've quoted enough to show this, that there, according to this Brethren historian, there's a clear link from the Jesuits through Irving on to Brethrenism. Absolutely clear link. Um, and that's from a Brethren historian. Um, where does Rory say that dispensationalism originated? Rory says this, informed dispensationalists recognize that as a system, dispensationalism was largely formulated by Darby. Now what we would say in response to that is it was repackaged by Darby. It started with the Jesuits, it was sponsored by Edward Irving, who uh, many of us know that Irving was extremely dodgy to say the least, um, sponsored by him at these Albury conferences which went on um, to Powers Court, which done away with the Pentecostal end of things, but kept this secret rapture dispensational type doctrine, which had its origin in the Jesuits. Rory says that it was formulated by Darby, um, but then he goes on to argue that the early church fathers had some form of uh, dispensational doctrine. He says, it may be rightly said that they held to primitive or early dispensational-like concepts. He quotes Irenaeus, who lived 130 to 200 AD, claiming that he had some rude form of dispensationalism. He quotes Irenaeus in these words, the gospel is quadriform, as is also the course followed by the Lord. For this reason, were four principal covenants given to the human race, one prior to the deluge under Adam the second, after that after the deluge under Noah, the third, the giving of the law under Moses, the fourth, that which renovates man and sums up all things in itself by means of the gospel, raising and bearing men upon its wings into the heavenly kingdom. Now the one thing you'll notice there is, first of all, not only does Irenaeus not use dispensational thought, but actually uses the idea of covenant. 
uh, and covenant theology. It's for covenants that God gave, not for dispensations. Um, it, and it's exactly what we, um, what we would believe, that God works not through dispensations, but God works through covenants. Because the covenants represent the great covenant, which is the covenant of grace based upon, if you want to get really, really theological, the covenant of redemption uh, was made between the Father and the Son. And then the covenant of grace is made between God and his elect people. Uh, Rory goes on to quote Augustine, who refers uh, to the former dispensation and the latter period. But all Augustine is referring to here is the times before and after Christ. It's not that we disagree with the use of the word dispensation, we just disagree with the idea of dispensationalism. In fact, even in part of his quote from Augustine, Augustine writes this, If it is now established that that which was for one age rightly ordained may be in another age rightly changed, the alteration, listen to what he says here, the alteration indicating a change in the work, not in the plan of him who makes the change. Now that's totally against dispensationalism. Because dispensationalism, its very premise is that there's a change in the purpose and a change in the plan. Augustine believed in one plan or one purpose of God in the world. Dispensationalism believes in at least two major ones, one concerning Israel and one concerning the church. Listen to what Lewis Sperry Schaefer said. This really um, proves the point. The dispensationalist believes that throughout the ages, God is pursuing two distinct purposes. One related to the earth with earthly people and earthly objectives involved, which is Judaism while the other is related to heaven with heavenly people and heavenly objectives involved, which is Christianity. Israel is an eternal nation, heir to an eternal land with an eternal kingdom, on which David rules from an eternal throne, so that in eternity never the twain Israel and the church shall meet. It's quite clear um, language. Uh, which is consistent, but completely unbiblical. Turn to Ephesians 3. Um, thankfully, we're getting to the scriptures. Uh, Ephesians 3 and verse 8. Ephesians 3, verse 8. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Now look at verse 11. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is one eternal purpose. There is one eternal plan. This, yes, is the manifold wisdom of God, but it's all according to the singular eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The dispensationalists say that the main distinctive of dispensationalism is the literal interpretation of Scripture. Well, I wonder did they take the following uh, literally. Uh, Galatians 3 and verses 28 and 29. Galatians 3 and especially verse 29. We'll just read verse 29 actually. That's the main verse. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now if we take that literally, then there can only be one people. There are not two peoples. There is only one people. If we belong to Christ, then we are part of the seed of Abraham, 
And the promise that was made to Abraham is fulfilled in us being in Christ. Many other scriptures we could look at, but that is sufficient to show that what Lewis Sperry Schaefer says is wrong. Going back um, to what Rory says regarding the origin of the covenant theology, he says covenant theology which originated in the 17th century. Now this, of course, covenant theology was more developed and more expanded in the 17th century, but it always existed in the church. Listen to what uh, Augustine says. When it is said, the male who was not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that soul should be cut off from his people because he has broken my covenant. Some may be troubled how that ought to be understood, since it can be no fault of the infant whose life is said must perish. Nor has the covenant of God been broken by him, but by his parents who have not taken care to circumcise him. But even the infants, not personally in their own life, But according to the common origin of the human race, have all broken God's covenant in that one in whom they have all sinned. Now that's covenant theology. That is the covenant of works. That is God bringing to bear on the whole of the human race what Adam did in the Garden of Eden. Now if dispensationalism is right, then that wouldn't fit in. Because... Adam stood, and we'll say this near near the end of of, of our time tonight, Adam stood as the federal head of the whole race, not just of his dispensation, but of all the world. And when Adam sinned, he brought all of the human race with him. Now there, Augustine goes on to say, now there are many things called God's covenants beside those two great ones, the old and the new which anyone who pleases may read and know for the first covenant which was made with the first man is just this. In the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. For the covenant from the beginning is, you shall die to death. That's the covenant of works, or as some say, the covenant of obedience. Now just as a by the way, the word covenant appears 292 times in the authorized version. The word dispensation appears four times. Huge difference. So covenant theology is all the way through the word of God. The word of God is constantly speaking of the covenants uh, as it reflects uh, the covenant of grace and the covenant of works. Now, it gets a little bit worse Riley mentions Isaac Watts as a pre-Derby dispensationalist, which he was. Watts was a dispensationalist. By the way, we're a church that sings uh, the Psalms only. Isaac Watts uh, was, was probably the single most instrumental uh, man to bring in non-inspired songs into the evangelical church. Why? Because he was a dispensationalist. He believed that the Psalms uh, were not sufficient for the Christian church because it was a different religion. Now, is that my words? Now, listen to what Isaac Watts says. Each of these dispensations of God may be represented as different religions. That's Isaac Watts' word. Each Of these dispensations of God may be represented as different religions or at least as different forms of religion appointed for men in the several successive ages of the world. And that's why Watson in another place talks about turning David into a Christian. And what he meant was taking the Psalms and rewriting them so that David becomes a Christian. David was a Christian because David believed in the Christ. So therefore all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, whether before his life or afterwards, are all Christians. It is one faith, one Lord, one faith and one baptism. Riley then quotes Darby and shows what he calls his philosophy of dispensationalism Uh, but the dispensations themselves all declare some leading principle this is interesting of interference of God that's Darby's view God is interfering Uh, now we can spend some time on that 
the idea of God interfering uh, in the world. No, we believe in a God who providentially is constantly ruling not only the world, but all the events of this world. He goes on to say, in every instance there was total and immediate failure as regarded man. And this brings us back to a point that's worth staying on for a moment. Uh, because the idea of dispensationalism is this. That each dispensation begins with a test. And man fails. And therefore God has to go on to another dispensation. Now the problem with this view is. There's a number of problems with this view. Uh, but one of the problems with this view is it's steeped in Arminianism really. Because the idea is that man had not failed completely after Adam. That man still somehow had the ability to pass a test after Adam. No, the Bible tells us that when Adam failed, we all failed, not just partially, but completely in him. And the Bible refers, the word of God refers to Christ as the last Adam. As the one who would, uh, there was no need for any other he was not only the second Adam in that sense, but he was the last Adam. The other problem with this point, or with this viewpoint in return, we, I know we looked at Romans 5 very recently. Just turn there with me for a second. Um, as we've already said, it destroys, this is very, very important. And this is why dispensationalism is so heretical. Um, it destroys the... Um, what Paul presents in Romans 5 of the symmetry between Adam and Christ. If there's seven disp different dispensations and seven different tests, it totally um, is outside the picture that Paul presents to us here in Romans 5 and verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, uh, for all have sinned, um, for until the law, and then um, down to um, verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude or likeness of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him that was to come. So here we see in this verse that the only two men that matter, and here's the point, let me put it as clearly as I can. The only two men that matter in God's economy of salvation is Adam and Christ. There is no other test. There is no other two men that matter. In Adam we die and in Christ we are made alive. But what dispensationalism says is this. That mankind is tested in each period of time and then mankind fails the test and so God has to start again. But here's, the, here's where it really becomes a problem. And we will get into this in more detail when we deal. Uh, I think next time we're going to look at the hermeneutics issue. And then salvation uh, after that. But here's where it becomes a real problem. Dispensationalism says that this age in which we live is also itself a failure. And it will only be in the millennial kingdom. That will be the success. Now we've said this already in a previous. But it's, it, this is worth really emphasizing again. The covenant view of scripture. And the covenant view of salvation. Says that the cross is the success. The cross is the center of God's plan. The cross is the very pinnacle of what God did for the salvation of sinners. Whereas dispensationalism says it's only in the millennial kingdom shall there be success in the ultimate sense. Verse 19 of Romans 5. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. 
One of the other, and we'll close with this, the other problem with dispensationalism, and I remember when I first realized this, uh, when I first actually comprehended this point, it was an eye-opener to say the least. Dispensationalism says that when the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, he came not initially to die on the cross, but initially to offer the kingdom. He came initially not to die, but to reign. Now this is strange, because quite often Arminians will, um, will challenge us because we, uh, we say that God commands uh, people to do something that they cannot do. And that's true. God commands all men everywhere to repent. God calls all men everywhere to live holy lives. We can't do that. And they think that's a problem. But they present a much bigger problem. They say, say that God offered something that he could not give. That's a bigger problem. God can command something that we cannot do. Because our inability comes out of our moral inability. Not our physical inability. But God cannot offer something that he could never give. How could God offer a kingdom to a people if they accept it? It means he cannot go to the cross. Now the very purpose for the Lord Jesus Christ coming into this world was so that he might die. In fact, one of his disciples was chosen in his sovereign purposes to be the betrayer that would bring him to the cross of Calvary. One of the criticisms of dispensationalism is of the covenant view and the reformed view is this uh, they say that we put the emphasis on the salvation of the elect uh, and they put the emphasis on the glory of God and we said in the previous time I, I reject that point anyway but the Lord Jesus Christ the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost that was his purpose not to offer a kingdom. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ could say, My kingdom is not of this world. I have not come to establish a kingdom in this world. In fact, as one commentator said, that if, if he was trying to establish an earthly kingdom, uh, well then, at least from a human point of view, the Romans would have had issue with him. The reason the Romans didn't have issue from their perspective was because they recognized that what the Lord Jesus was bringing was something spiritual. We thank God that the Lord Jesus Christ did come, not with a confused purpose, not with a confused plan, but he came. He came for the glory of God and for the salvation of sinners. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Well, well, we'll stop there and we'll pray God's blessing and then we'll continue, God willing, next time. Let us stand for closing prayer. Oh Lord, we, we bless you and we thank you. We thank you for the one who came. The one who came to be the salvation of his people. And lo Lord, even as we have considered the origin of certain doctrines. O oh Lord, we thank you that we look to thy word this night. We look to thy word as the foundation. As the cornerstone of all our relationship with the living God. Oh Lord, we pray that you would fix our thoughts and minds upon the Lord Jesus Christ this night. And that Lord, you would bless us in the rest of our fellowship. And even as we've considered that which is false, oh Lord, we pray that you would bring us to the truth of thy holy word. Bless us this night. We give you thanks for the refreshments that we shall receive. In our Saviour's name. Amen. Amen.